Perfect. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to day two uh, of the Collaborative uh, Contracting Summit. I have the pleasure of kicking off today and supporting a couple of other uh, presentations during the day and building on the great foundation that uh, all the presenters uh, started yesterday. Um, I can move forward here. There we go. Um, just give me a second while I move stuff out of the way. All right. So we're going to walk through a little bit of a review that uh, we, we saw some of it uh, yesterday. Uh, the need for a change. Uh, Annabelle talked about my a little bit about my own personal experience with uh, all the various projects and industries I've been involved in. I'm going to walk through some background, a little bit of history on collaborative contracting. Um, not going to dive in as deep as uh, uh, Craig did yesterday. I'm going to talk about collaborative contracting approaches and then I'm going to jump into some of the more uh, prominent uh, collaborative model uh, templates and, and do a bit of a, a comparison uh, between them. And then I'll wrap up with some golden nuggets. Uh, uh, one, one of the things hopefully you're, you're, you gained it from yesterday and you should gain from today is that collaborative contracting is an evolving practice. This, there is not a single answer, a single solution, because all projects are different, organizations are different, the countries that the projects are built in are different. And so what we're finding is, while well, a lot of the elements are similar, there are some nuances that apply to, to different uh, circumstances, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of that today within the hour that I have. And give me one more second there we go okay my slide will move forward there we go so the need for a change um, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of studies out there that talk about the need for the change um, I grab this text in particular this is the opening text in the research report that came out of the uh, CAI RT341 uh, research. We had uh, four academics, we had 20 leading business businesses, uh, companies that were multi, multi-billion dollars down to some, some really focused specialty uh, companies. And, and the reality is industrial projects are risky business ventures. Um, so I'm not going to take you through all of this. Um, uh, the one piece you heard yesterday, and we, and we continually hear when we're, when we're talking to folks and a lot of us experience, is that the adversarial environment created risk shedding structures of traditional de delivery methods gets in the way. And it gets in the way in many ways, but one of the more important ones, it gets in the way from, um, uh, in a way of uh, real innovation that can happen on a project. When, uh, um, and as one of the presenters yesterday said, when, when we're having fun on a project, innovation happens, creativity happens. You don't necessarily have a uh, strategy on a project. Uh, but what most of us will tell you is that if you're having a fun project under a traditional method, you've got strong leadership um, that really knows what they're doing. Uh, collaborative contracting, on the other hand, um, is all about distributing leadership, and you don't necessarily have to have the A team that uh, was referred to yesterday. Um, that distributed leadership allows uh, various experiences to support each other. Uh, as you're planning and building your project. This is an interesting slide. 
uh, in terms of uh, the challenges uh, we have on projects. The big one on the right is the one that jumps out at me every time I look at this slide. 57% of resources are wasted in construction as compared with 26% wasted in manufacturing. So the whole point of collaborative contracting um, and using lean methods, um, and you heard a little bit about OS2, and I encourage you to uh, stand for operating system two in construction. Um, I encourage you to um, spend some time uh, following that as well. Uh, it's all about reducing waste. And as Bob said earlier, getting a better return on investment for the employees, the shareholders and the customers um, that use the products that uh, come from our, our uh, industrial asset development. This is a slide that we saw yesterday from a, of a different point of view, uh, but, it, but it builds on it. And again, the challenge in the construction sector, particularly the industrial construction sector, is our labor productivity is flat. While we have innovation, we have new tools, we have better power tools, we have battery powered tools now, uh, hand tools that, uh, uh, that help make the work better. There is an overlay of regulatory requirements uh, from health and safety, environmental, um, that combined with an aging workforce means that actually going back to the uh, 1950s, the productivity rate is pretty much flat as compared to um, uh, the other uh, 14 sectors of the economy. And if you look at uh, manufacturing, you know, uh, it's 3.6% productivity increase uh, over the last uh, 26 years. And if you look at the total economy, you, you can see that it's, it's, it's tripled. Uh, the rate in industrial construction. And, and as you look to the reasons why, uh, there, there's lots of research papers out there, but these two studies in particular jump out at me uh, because all of you and all of us that are presenting this contracting summit here and are listening to this contracting summit, we represent on the right hand chart, the green and the blue books. We're the folks that plan and organize the projects. And collectively, we represent 66% of the problem in terms of why industrial uh, construction um, has not uh, demonstrated uh, productivity gains uh, as compared to uh, our peers. Uh, McKinsey and company uh, put a report out um, in 2015 that was pretty much supporting this graph. Poor organization and decision making, inadequate communication, flawed performance management, poor short term planning, insufficient risk management, and then limited talent management. And so, hopefully, what you'll gain from this second day, as well as from the first, is that collaborative contracting in its various forms helps overcome a lot of these reasons for um, industrial projects uh, not keeping pace with uh, other industries. And it's not just about cost and schedule. Uh, uh, it's also about quality and in particular safety. And, and you know, here's three examples and it's, it's quite easy to, uh, to go out and search the internet and find multiple, multiple examples where because of poor project performance, safety performance lacked. You saw, I think yesterday, Bob uh, Weibel presented the CII safety, uh, annual safety uh, slide um, that we do in conjunction with the Construction Users Roundtable. And it showed a significant performance improvement by using uh, CII's best, CII best practices uh, as compared to the rest of uh, the construction industry. And that's measured over billions of hours within the uh, 
CII membership and a CURT uh, membership. Uh, so, in, in preparing for this presentation, I literally spent 35 seconds. I Googled uh, construction uh, safety incident images, and there were pages and pages and pages of them. Um, and, you know, safety, as we heard yesterday, if you have poor safety on a project, it's a bit of a bellwether for letting uh, folks know that your project is probably not performing well. Um, and again, it, it, it comes back to traditional contracting methods. Um, you know, uh, how we tender, you know, hence Annabelle and I with the power and utility sector are, are, are looking at how we tender and go out and um, acquire services for uh, engineering construction. Um, too many projects uh, are looking backwards six, eight, 12 weeks at reports, uh, monthly reports, to be able to make a decision about tomorrow when the technology exists. Um, we just have to choose to use them, and we have to choose them in a way that everybody sees the same data at the same time. There is a growing trend to adopt best practices, uh, IPD, I2PD, alliancing, partnering has been around a little while longer, um, and um, what we have found is with sufficient investments in upfront planning, project run better, they're more successful. Uh, even in the traditional methods, uh, Bob quoted some statistics this morning from uh, organizations within CII that use our best practices combined with traditional contracting methods and, and there is significant improvements. When you combine that with collaborative contracting, uh, we think that the uh, research that uh, uh, Allison, myself, Bruce, Phil, Dr. Phil Baruth, and others are involved in will show that the multiplier effect of those best practices along with collaborative contracting will be significantly more than just uh, best practices with traditional contracting uh, alone. Um, go to the next slide. Okay. So a bit of a background, a bit of a history. So, um, so the history I'm talking about today is with respect to the modern construction industry, modern industrial practices, but you can go back to the dawn of time and find examples of collaboration. Um, so rather than go back to the dawn of time, and I thought about that for today's presentation, I thought I'd start with something a little near and dear to uh, those of us uh, around the uh, video camera today. So construction partnering uh, as an industry best practice uh, began with a research committee back in 1983. And there was significant follow on research. It became a best practice. Um, and the partnering uh, methodology uh, was updated in 1996. And then there were some further presentations made right up into the uh, I think 2007 was the last presentation. So partnering, I'll talk a little bit about more. Uh, that, that's a, what we'll call a, a collaborative-ish project. Uh, if you think of Richard's scale from yesterday, for those that were on, it's, it's, it's somewhere to the middle or slightly to the left of, of that scale of uh, levels of collaboration. Alliances, first used successfully in 1994. Um, in the UK on an industrial project. Um, started with seven contractors. Um, then uh, about the same time, uh, two alliances were launched in Australia, again in the oil and gas industry, um, that were quite successful. Australia followed those successes up with uh, their public sector alliances in their infrastructure projects. Um, uh, in the late 90s. Um, and then we had back here in North America, 
uh, integrated project delivery uh, developing in the late 90s following Alliancing um, and was launched officially uh, in 2000 when it was trademarked and the first pure IPD project uh, uh, commenced in 2009. Uh, we heard a little bit yeah, about the um, NEC3 um, agreement from the, the team yesterday. NEC3 is uh, a collaborative ish uh, contracting strategy, and I'll talk a little bit about that. It was published in 2005. NEC stands for New Engineering Contract, and it's a family of contracts that cover all the various aspects of, uh, of uh, contracting uh, out of England. Uh, in 2018, the uh, NEC4 was published. Uh, a number of the contracts and languages were updated and integrated based on what the industry had learned, and they uh, provided a fully integrated alliancing contract. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, then, in 19, or sorry, in 2018, uh, I2PD was published. Uh, it actually started with an idea at a CII Board of Advisors meeting in the fall of 2015. Uh, it was put forward as a research topic, got accepted in 2016. The group launched and uh, we published in 2018. Um, as we heard from uh, the team yesterday and Richard, uh, the uh, COA Collaborative Framework uh, was launched, uh, published in, in May of 2020. And then, you know, collaborative contracting isn't new to, isn't something that, that we invented um, specific for the way we do projects. It's out there in other industries. So I, I picked two points to talk about here, uh, one of which is um, automotive. Um, automotive industry had severe quality problems, uh, as some of us. Uh, may all um, recall and they went through a, a lot of change uh, they improved how they built their plants they improved how they launched their new product lines and a lot of that can be uh, goes back to uh, not only the toyota um, quality method but to uh, a doctor a uh, dr rupert uh, stuffer who developed a collaborative project management uh, uh, for the automotive industry. And then in uh, March of 2017, uh, ISO, International um, Standards Organization, published a framework to assist organizations of any size to develop uh, collaboration business relationships to be able, again, to promote innovation, competitiveness, outcome success. And that was based on a British standard uh, that was published in 2006. So a little bit of history. What you should take away from this slide is essentially that modern collaborative contracting has been around for um, 30 plus years uh, and has continued to evolve. And if, uh, if uh, you kind of put this in a timeline, you can see the pace of change started slow and what we see in the last uh, five, six years, and you're gonna hear about today is continuing pace of change where industry and academics are working together to refine these collaborative uh, contracting strategies and develop specialty um, templates for various industry sectors and uh, I'm suspecting various project sizes and, and um, private versus public, uh, um, et cetera. So just a little bit to build on what uh, we talked about uh, yesterday, the difference between formal collaboration and informal collaboration. So formal collaboration that I'm going to spend the balance of today talking about um, is uh, when you've contracted a formal agreement using one of the collaborative contracting templates. You've your project organization is in an integrated team where it's all about the project as opposed to other individual companies. You've got integrated project management information systems, a single system 
single estimate, single uh, schedule, single document management, construction management uh, um, tools, uh, negotiated risk sharing, no blame, uh, no claim type culture and clauses in the agreement, uh, a risk reward plan. Um, whereas informal collaboration can be all of what I talked about there up into actually having a multi-party or poly-party agreement. Uh, uh, you can do almost all of what's in the formal contracting agreement if you so choose under traditional contracting methods. It's a little more work. Um, and hopefully over the course of the day, you'll understand uh, by having not only people willing to work collaboratively, but having an agreement that supports them having to work collaboratively and having the right risk reward plans in place. And uh, that's key, the right risk reward plan uh, to drive behavior. Um, uh, our experience is that formal collaboration gets you farther down the path to the project success. But if you can't get there for whatever reason within your organization, um, uh, informal collaboration is still a significant improvement over um, traditional methods uh, where we're um, uh, in a uh, in a competitive mode with each other as, as, as we try and build these projects. And so that little graph on the side, you'll see more of this graph. Uh, maybe you saw, saw a different version of it. Uh, and, you know, we started with design, bid, build. And as you move from left to, to right, uh, EPC, EPCM, uh, construction management risks, kind of that brown and right hand of the blue circle there. Uh, they're more collaborative, they're collaborative-ish. They, they use some of the methods, um, early contract, uh, their involvement as an example, partnering sessions, 3D models, uh, BIM for the uh, building, commercial building world. Whereas the full formal collaboration, including I2PD, um, add on that relational contracting, multi-party agreements, uh, equitable decision-making is a big one, and that best for project culture. Okay, um, so when we launched the ITPD research back in 2016, the question we asked ourselves is why isn't alliancing or IPD being applied to the industrial market? And so we went in and took a look at it and I don't want to steal a lot of um, thunder for the next one, but essentially we found there is a difference. And so what we found is that, um, you know, IPD, um, while it covers the full spectrum, is weighted in terms of the benefits towards design optimization, whereas alliancing, if you look at all the methods and tools and clauses, it's weighted toward uh, reducing uh, construction risks. And what we found is industrial projects have both design optimization requirements as well as construction risk requirements. And hence the difference in that uh, graph on the uh, left-hand side there is uh, right out of the uh, research paper that talks about uh, how we uh, went about measuring and scoring the, uh, the various methods and uh, KPIs uh, to be able to see if there was a difference. Um, and, and indeed, we found that there was a difference. And we weren't expecting it. Um, so why focus on partnering, alliancing, uh, IPD or I2PD um, uh, today uh, from a point of view of collaborative contracting? Um, and a simple answer is these methods cover the broadly accepted forms of collaboration contracting around the globe. Um, alliancing is in, used now um, in over 23 countries, as an example. Um, and one or more of these methods will fit projects which are candidates for collaborative contracting. Not all projects are candidates, uh, but if your project fits some of the norms that we heard about yesterday and, her, and we'll hear about it again today, 
one of these methods will fit. Um, now, like all contracting templates and methods, it's going to have to be fit to your organization, your supply chain, and your particular project, um, and the global geographical location and uh, national jurisdiction in, in which it resides. So just a bit of a background uh, before we jump right into the approaches uh, or, or the methods is, and you'll see slightly different lists, but collaboration and integration principles uh, typically are these nine principles, continuous and communi communication and issue resolution, jointly developed and validated targets, access to shared information systems, early stakeholder involvement, collaborative and equitable decision-making, financial transparency among key uh, participants, shared risk reward, multi-party multi -party agreements, and negotiated risk distribution. You will, you will see typically these nine uh, principles implemented in all the various contracting templates. Um, now these approaches are supported with a lot of different methods. And I'm not gonna walk you through these methods. This presentation will be up and made available to you. Um, but a lot of the methods are now lean methods um, or best practices from uh, places like uh, CII and AACE. And um, some of them are designed to be to, to foster collaboration, um, probably the most one of the most powerful one is co-location, what's called the big room, um, alternate schedule planning, uh, pull planning, tack time type planning. Again, very collaborative in, in terms of uh, how that planning is done. Um, some of them are tools and um, and um, methods that are encoded in the agreement to support uh, reduced or distributed risks, so mutual liability waivers, no dispute charters. Some of the methods have to do with uh, construction efficiency, such as uh, pre-assembly or modular construction. Um, use of technology as an integrated tool. So, I have a degree in computer science and mathematics, and I and, and, and as Annabelle said, I've worked on projects for the last 40 years in every industry you can imagine. And it surprises me that we'll spend two, three hundred million dollars in a large organization on implementing an SAP system for finance. Yeah. An organization that spends three, five, ten billion dollars a year in capital and sustaining projects has a hard time spending five million dollars on integrated project management tools. The technology is out there. There, there. there are very few organizations that use it well in managing the projects. And there are even fewer examples where you have an integrated approach with your cost, schedule, risk, document management integrated so that the whole project team can see these tools. Um, and talk about a powerful way of integrating your teams and getting your teams to collaborate is when they see the same information at the same time, you're doing real time progressing. A um, little bit about uh, partnering versus alliancing and IPD. The term partnering and alliancing are often used interchangeably, um, although they do describe different procurement uh, methods that are quite different in the way they address the distri distribution of uh, risk and reward. Partnering in particular can be defined as a commitment by those involved in a project or outsourced work to closely cooperate rather than competitively uh, and adversarially work together. Um, I'm not gonna read you through all this. Um, one of the key things is that partnering involves two or more organizations that are looking to perform particular um, 
work scopes or outcomes through agreeing to partner together and sharing um, um, and agreeing to mutual objectives. Probably the most important distinction between partnering and uh, alliancing IPD is that the partners still retain their independence and they individually suffer or gain from the relationship. Whereas in collaborative contracting, it's uh, the, the boats all float or sink together. Alliancing and uh, IPD projects uh, form a cohesive entity that jointly shares the risks and the award based on an agreed to formula. And we're going to talk about that in a minute, some of those formulas. Um, there's both the legal considerations that are in the form of contract. I mentioned a few of those uh, a couple of slides ago. And, um, but just as important are the non-legal considerations, such as good faith, trust, openness, and a collaborative uh, mentality. And so there's a value session that most uh, collaborative contracting projects go through right at the beginning to establish the, the values that make sense to uh, that particular project and that particular group. They tend to be the, the same cluster of values uh, that everyone I've been involved in. Uh, it's an exercise that you go through and pull those values out of the uh, project team. And that's those are the values that they then plan and execute the project on, and they use those values to guide their work processes, their decision making, and how they treat each other. Uh, aliancing is an ideal way to align the commercial interests of all the participants. Um, and then finally, uh, I like this one, uh, aliancing and IPD are often described as a, a risk embrace culture. Uh, under which parties seek to better manage risks by embracing them and working together to manage them within a flexible uh, delivery environment. So we're going to walk through some of the more popular um, collaboration uh, models. Um, I, I included NEC3 here, even though it's not a full collaboration model, because it was the foundation for NEC4. And uh, in particular, one of the more famous projects that was built using NEC3 is the uh, 2012 Summer Olympic Games. And a more current project that's under construction right now is the massive uh, Hinkley uh, Point uh, nuclear project in, in the UK. Um, and it provides collaborative-ish uh, method. Uh, with three uh, specific clauses, uh, one based on actions that recodifies the requirement for all to act in the spirit of mutual trust and cooperation. Um, second is all about risk ne negotiation and reduction it requires early risk no negotiation and early joint risk mitigation meetings for all the parties at risk. And finally, the third is timely decision making. Work plans, schedule, look aheads, progress meetings, etc. Um, partnering, again, another collaborative ish approach. It's a best practice. Uh, it's part of uh, CII, came out of CII, um, out of research uh, summary uh, 1002. Um, and it's a um, used across all industry sectors, uh, from single point projects to multiple projects over long terms. They're typically called strategic partnerships. Um, typically bilateral agreements as opposed to multi-party uh, agreements, um, but multi-party agreements are not unheard of in partnering. Typically owners and engineers or owners and contractors or owners and subcontractors entering into these bilateral agreements optimizes the teams for these specific functions, less duplication, incentives are, are based on, on specific goal achievements under the partnering agreement. There is a negotiated risk specific to their, their goal achievement. There's reduced litigation, uh, but um, there isn't, um, you know, a uh, 
because of the collaboration, there's reduced litigation as opposed to a formal commitment uh, not to litigate except in, in, in cases of uh, um, gross negligent and uh, willful um, will, will, willful uh, uh, breach of contract. Um, there is uh, continuous improvements from project to project, uh, specifically with the strategic partnership. So there's some learning that happens uh, that improves outcomes over time. And you can see down there the uh, slide I pulled out of the research paper for um, um, the uh, partnering uh, process model. And I'll let you read through that. Then we come to the first full, uh, not the first, but uh, uh, the first of my slide deck, uh, collaborative uh, co collaboration model, uh, the NEC4. Uh, out of England, it's used across all industry sectors. It's based on a multi-party agreement. Um, um, early uh, contractor involvement, uh, information modeling, uh, 3D for the industrial folks, and BIM for the commercial folks. Uh, it's based on the principles of cost, cost transparency, full cost transparency, timely decision making, the, that early warning register uh, and risk notification uh, was reduced and specifically prescribed to be one week uh, under this new uh, contract format. Timely dispute resolution, more integrated uh, and aligned insurance thing to bring the cost of insurance down, and then defined uh, incentives and shared saving arrangements. Uh, the graph you see there uh, kind of sets out uh, and NEC for Alliance contract organization, you have the board or the executive team, you have the managers, the delivery team, and then you have the various, uh, various, the various members um, of the Alliance underneath. With respect to alliancing, um, Even though it came out of the UK, it came into its own in uh, Australia and New Zealand. It's now widely used in uh, over 23 countries. It's fully collaborative and integrated, typically used for infrastructure projects, but as it's reached more and more uh, national jurisdictions, um, alliancing is being used for projects in, in all the city um, sectors. Um, it's weighted towards construction risk mitigation over design optimization. But again, that's, that's a matter of degrees, and uh, that's not something that can't be written into your specific um, agreement if you choose to lose, uh, use a, an alliancing agreement uh, to focus on both design optimization and risk mitigation. Um, integrated teams, early involvement of key parties, integrated decision making, fair and equitable uh, sharing of risk, liability waivers, insurance optimization, um, indemnification limitations, collaborative dispute resolution, and again, the shared risk reward models. And then again, on the right, you can see a typical alliancing organization. One of the things is you get to know these different methods. Um, lots of different acronyms um, but you find out as you walk through it, it's typically the same nine principles and the same 20 odd methods 21 methods being used but with slightly different uh, terminology then there's the commercial ipd uh, started in uh, back in uh, 2000 and uh, it's mid 2000s with its first fully uh, executed uh, project in 2009. It's typically used where we see it used is in the institution or, or commercial projects uh, based on the research we've done. Starting to see it used uh, in North America in, in some infrastructure projects and some smaller industrial projects. Several are popular forms of agreement uh, that we'll talk about a little bit later either three-party or multi-party agreements or 
sometimes just referred to as poly party agreements, uh, typically used in, uh, sorry, includes integrated teams, processes, and systems, um, early involvement of key parties, uh, shared contingency, uh, uses a number of lean methods specifically called out uh, and refers to lean in a lot of these templates and, and models. Recommends the use of BIM, uh, again, given that it's coming out of the institutional commercial world. Uh, and again, the uh, risk sharing models. And so IPD brings the project organization, if you look at the diagram on the right, the commercial terms through the agreement, integrated form of agreement, or IFOA, you'll hear that term quite often. Um, and the operating system, and that's the methods and, and means uh, that are selected as part of putting the commercial terms together. Not all projects use all nine principles, not all projects use all 21 methods. Um, so your project is part of creating itself. will look to choose those principles and methods that fit your project. And in the I2PD project, or what we call industrial IPD, uh, is designed, has been designed specifically for optimized design and reduced construction risk in industrial projects. It consists of a multi-party agreement that integrates elements of DPC agreements, uh, IPD agreements, and alliancing agreements. Um, and that's an important distinction. A lot of the commercial agreements uh, don't carry the same clauses that you would see typically in EPC um, type agreements that we see in the industrial space. Integrated teams, processes and systems again. Again, a, a big one that helps shape behavior is the shared, shared contingency. And again, the use of lean methods. 3D modeling use is encouraged. Um, you know, that, that's still a journey that a lot of organizations are on. Liability waivers, insurance, optimization, and indemnification liability. And then the collaborative dispute resolution and then the shared risk reward models. And the image on the right is an image that uh, we developed coming out of the research team. It shows the project in the middle and the various suppliers and the owner uh, cooperatively working together around the, the outside. And, you know, it, it can be one or more engineers, one or more OEMs, one or more GCs and consultants, depending on the size and scope of your project. But those are the general uh, flavors uh, of the key participants. And then as you look to the various agreements out there, um, the ones I included in the slide, and, and there's, you'll, you'll hear about a couple more that are coming uh, uh, today. The ones I included in the slide, in this slide, are the ones that are out there now and they're in use, and there's examples of projects using them. Um, so from an alliancing point of view, you've got the, the new NEC4 uh, agreement. Then there's the Alliancing Association of Australia, Australia model. Um, there's actually a couple of models out of Australia. And then now there's, as I said, 23 countries around the world. So um, you could create quite an exhaustive list, but those two in particular um, seem to have all the elements uh, as, as we did our review in terms of looking at alliancing. And then from the commercial world, um, I started with the Hanson Bridge uh, Standard Multi-Party Agreement. It was the first out there. Uh, followed by the Canadian Construction Documents Committee, the CCDC 30, that came out in 2018. And then the um, American uh, Institute of Architects um, have a family of uh, collaborative uh, templates, uh, consensus doc uh, produces uh, another family of um, Collaborative uh, contracts uh, uh, in, in their 300 series. Um, and then uh, the Australian government again has uh, an IPD form of uh, commercial slash in, in, institutional uh, collaborative agreement. And then finally, uh, the, the latest one that you hear a lot about uh, for the balance of today is the Construction Industry Institute I2PD model. 
a multi-party agreement um, specific to large industrial projects. So in summary, collaborative contracting has been around for almost 30 years and it works. There are study after study after study that show that it works. Yeah, there's been a few failures. And typically those failures, I think somebody asked a question yesterday, uh, those failures tend to be on, um, from our research, uh, the biggest one is there wasn't enough attention paid to selecting the companies that and the owners that were part of the team. It's something that you have to commit to fully for that project. And you have to pick teams of people who are going to work together. It would be, I mean, one of the uh, pieces of advice that we got out of Australia, it was, um, you know, if you're, if you're going to have a problem with somebody um, and, and they don't fit that culture, deal with it quickly. Um, but for the most part, it works. Uh, the percentage of uh, projects that work is, is staggering compared to the ones that don't work. Collaborative contracting is still improving, as I talked about earlier, as we can see from the evolving methods you're going to hear about today. Select the integrated form of agreement that best fits your industry and your project. Um, and then traditional contracting strategies, as I said, can benefit from implementing some most of the elements of collaborative contracting and they become collaborative-ish. And so with that, Bob, I am pretty much done. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. I uh, want to see if we uh, open this up so we do have questions coming in uh, using our question uh, facility, but I do have a couple of initial ones uh, for you that have already come in. Is there really only a small difference between collaborative contracting templates? Um, you know, I'd love to say no, there's a significant difference. So probably the best way I've, I've said it is, the, if you think of the principles and methods as the ingredients, the contracting templates are the recipe so you can put flour together with sugar and eggs and water, and you can make a lot of different things depending on how you combine them. And that's the same with these uh, uh, collaborative contracts. It depends how you put them together, where the emphasis is that you, you, you see the difference. Um, and as I talked about, difference between, you know, alliancing is, its history is heavily weighted towards infrastructure projects what we call commercial IPD or IPD is heavily weighted in terms of use in the uh, commercial institutional world and the industrial uh, IPD uh, is designed specifically and the principles and methods have been uh, the intensity and the use of the principles and methods that we'll go into later today are uh, designed specifically for industrial projects to, to deliver both that design optimization and the construction risk mitigation. So if you think of recipes and ingredients, that'll help as an analogy. Good. Uh, one uh, question that came in that several people have uh, supported, collaboration doesn't just happen because you want it to. What specific actions <clears throat> Have you seen owners and APCs take to change behavior that results in collaboration? So there are leading owners that are taking the steps. And without the owners, this doesn't happen. Um, but most owners are sitting back, sitting back and waiting. Um, nobody ever got fired for hiring IBM, was an old saying if they've been around for 30 or 40 years. And that's the same with uh contracting strategies in the industrial space so there are leading owners and then there are owners that want to move forward and i'm working with one right now whose belief is that their supply chain isn't ready and then there are supply chain members epcs constructors uh, equipment suppliers consultants that say hey we're ready and we're already doing it in the commercial world we want to and, and we're using alliancing overseas 
we'd like to be able to apply collaborative contracting in the industrial world. And uh, in particular, the uh, Organization for Canadian um, uh, Nuclear um, uh, OCNI Institute, um, we've established a 20 member committee representing all their, all their members putting together presentations in the nuclear world for nuclear operators to say, hey, we in the supply chain are ready. We think that the nuclear industry will benefit from collaborative contracting. We think our projects will run better. We think our, our, our profits will be protected and we think your cost and schedules will be protected, Mr. Romer. So um, it's, and you know, it, it's like a, uh, a big circle back in 20, 20, the circle was wide with few people um, on the circle, moving around the circle. And as time moves on, the circle gets tighter and tighter and there's more and more players. And now we can actively see leading supply chain members and leading uh, owners, such as the owners that are here uh, yesterday and today, getting together and saying, we want this. We want these improvements. Hopefully that answered the question. Okay. Uh, is there an I2PD model contract or form of contract which covers the differences from traditional contract types or a mapping of the principles to the traditional types? Um, there is a formal contract template that we'll talk about a little bit today. And it deals and it works with the nine principles and 21 methods that I, I showed today. Um, but it leaves it to the organizations to choose the principles and methods. Um, uh, it dictates though the number of principles and methods, not which ones specifically, the number of um, principles and methods that need to be used and the intensity levels, uh, uh, what we call a CI index, a collaboration and integration index. And research shows that you've got to be at a, a level of at least 15 on the CI scale. And you can learn more about that by, by, by looking at CII's research paper. Um, okay. Hopefully that answered the question. Good. It was mentioned that projects are, are, are candidates, in quotes, for collaborative contracting. Are there projects where collaborative contracting cannot be implemented? Well, rather than cannot, maybe should not. Um, well-defined projects with well-defined scopes, with experienced um, suppliers and in industries where organizations don't have deep experience in uh, managing uh, construction contracts. I mean, those would be all elements um, that lend you to think that you might want to look at one of the more traditional approaches, um, whereas, you know, a loosely defined scope, uh, lots of risk, lots of complexity, would all be elements that would lead you towards uh, looking at a co collaborative approach. Um, the um, research team that's working right now is developing a tool. Dr. Phil Baruth and his team are leading that tool and a number of, of us from industry are providing in input to that tool. And it's a build on of a tool that came out of, the, uh, out of New Zealand in terms of taking you through the decision-making and a formal process to help you decide uh, whether collaboration um, as a contracting model um, is a good model. And uh, we're about 80% done that tool. I think they're looking to publish that tool um, at the annual conference, CII annual conference this summer. And uh, that uh, that will more formally help uh, people understand which projects are better suited and which projects are not better suited. Okay, we have time for maybe two more questions. <clears throat> How do we consistently bridge the gap from traditional contracts to collaborative contract types so they become the norm? 
how do we consistently bridge the gap? It's the old um, Star, uh, Star Trek um, uh, quote, right? It's all about the journey, not the destination. <laughs> so, or there was the other quote, uh, uh, that uh, thousand uh, mile truck across uh, Asia by Marco Polo began with the first step. So, and I think Richard talked about it yesterday and Alice is gonna talk about it today. Pick a project, pick one that you know well. Start with a pilot that fits your organization. You know, obviously don't, uh, put your whole organization at risk, uh, training, get your people out to attend seminars like this so they get better background, um, speak to colleagues in industry, uh, like the, the, those of us uh, presenting over the last couple of days. Um, it's not hard. Um, you know, at one time, somebody had to implement the first EPC contract and somebody had to implement the first EPCM contract and so on and so forth, right? So, um, and as I said, this stuff has been around for 30 years. So it's really a, it's really a mindset that says, uh, and I'll still want to Bruce's, Bruce Burwell's comments. He says, if you like the outcomes of the way you're doing projects today, then keep doing what you're doing. But if you don't, you might want to look at a different approach. Okay. Uh, if the oil, and gas, and petro industries, or is the uh, oil and gas petro industries picking up any of these integrated forms of agreement? Yes. You heard it a little bit yesterday from Shell and from Exxon. I can tell you that um, Chevron, uh, as well, is. Uh, on the research committee, uh, Exxon has somebody on the research committee for ITPD. Um, I'm thinking of the other big majors. There's nobody from uh, BP yet, um, although you know I, I suspect that they're, they're, they're like everybody else. The same pressures are there, and um, Conical Phillips. I don't think we've got anybody on the research team. Sorry. TC Energy. Uh, Trans Canada Energy um, from the pipeline midstream world is on the research committee. So it's moving into the oil and gas world, uh, and every not everybody, but more and more of the, the majors. And as the majors go, the industry goes in, in a lot of cases. Okay, and we have time, we have time for one more. Uh, how do you define to fail to meet objective? Any examples? Yes. Um, Well, I'll, I'll give you a, 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 a recent example. So in the collaborative contracting method, one of your objectives is to produce a schedule that, uh, uh, is, that you can deliver against, that is well-defined, that all parties understand, um, and all key participants in the project understand. You know, too often in the traditional world, that doesn't happen. But, um, you know, I've got a live example. I'm not going to share who it is, but I've got a live example of that not being the case um, today after a ton of collaborative effort. So. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Michael.